Welcome to Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Its 4,500 residents think of their little mountain village as a paradise. John Denver thought so too. He immortalized the region in his famous song, Take Me Home Country Roads. Point Pleasant is located where the Ohio and Kanawha rivers meet in a quiet setting that blends touches of history with still affordable family homes. Today, Point Pleasant is as peaceful a place as its name suggests. But it wasn't always so. In the 1960s, a series of frightening events occur. At first bizarre and disturbing, then suddenly tragic. The story begins when several villagers have close encounters with a semi-human flying creature. Eyewitness accounts put Point Pleasant on the map. It becomes one of the most visited spots in the United States for seekers of paranormal phenomena. It's been over 45 years since the first sighting, but it remains one of the great unexplained mysteries. We kept the kids in at night, we didn't allow them out. Six to seven feet tall, gray in collar, uh, large wingspan, 10 to 12 foot wingspan. Seven foot tall with a wingspan of 50 feet with glowing red eyes. Six feet tall with the big wings and the red eyes, because everybody says there's red eyes, like you can't miss that detail. Those eyes, that's, that's what hell did, was this a red? A lot of people says it glowed. I don't know about that. I just know it was a red like you never seen red. Uh, one person thought it was a helicopter. It was so big. Another local guy here, he thought it was an airplane. Other people described it as looking like a giant moth because it didn't have a head like a human. It was more in and it had moth-like wings and so forth. Other people described it as, uh, you know, being very quick as far as flight. You know, it would, it would appear and then it would, be, it would disappear. My papa always said it was just a bird because he used to go out there all the time. But he said he saw something out there, so I'll believe him. It had a heel like we do, a heel and a long foot out with claw, uh, toes and claws on the end of the toes. It had a neck like we do that holds a round type head. It had a nose like we do, and I saw two holes that you breathe out of. In the mid-1960s, 100 people claimed to have seen the half-man, half-moth, with huge glowing red eyes flying around the area. For two years, more and more eyewitnesses come forward. Peaceful Point Pleasant is never the same again. Well, Point, Point Pleasant, as it is today, is a very simple, it's a, it's a simple place. And back in the 60s, it was even more so. You had hardworking Americans, farmers, and people like that. They really didn't take stock into monsters or UFOs or anything like that. They worked long days and hard days, and they were down-to-earth practical people that went to church on Sundays. This isn't, this isn't something that they plotted or planned. It's just something that happened and they couldn't explain it. And even today, all these years later, it's still a mystery. Some of those, those uh, Mothman witnesses, uh, um, you know, became very, uh, you know, they su suffered nervous breakdowns and, and uh, mental issues and things. And totally different people as to what they were beforehand. Over the years, you know, they just, they never could come up with a, a viable answer as to what, what happened or what they experienced. Now, a lot of people in the town getting thought messages, so they said, uh, saying that something was going to happen. Some people were even having physical effects, like their eyes getting swelled up and red and so forth for no particular reason. In fact, I think a lot of people that had up-close encounters of this Mothman creature uh, said that their eyes got inflamed and what have you. It could have been like a, an angel of death or an omen. Like the personification of an omen of coming to warn people that something terrible is going to happen. Fear begins to grip the people of Point Pleasant. Some believe the creature is an omen, a premonition of catastrophe about to fall on their village and its inhabitants. And soon enough, that's precisely what happens. When the bridge fell, it actually tilted to the right, came back up, and then just went down. That is, instead of a collapse like sometimes we see on TV or uh, in pictures, the eyewitnesses said that it actually went to the side, 
then came back up and went down. It's late evening, November 15th, 1966. What happens on this night gives birth to one of the most horrific legends ever recorded in American history. There were two young couples uh, up near the North Power Plant in the TNT area. That was a vacated, desolate area at one time during World War II. That was a uh, ammunitions factory. That's how it got us named the TNT area. They were driving around up there about 11 o'clock at night. Um, they came across what they thought was a man standing in the road in, in front of their car. They noticed something standing next to the plant, uh, which looked like a very large man in dark clothing or uh, a cloak and what have you. And they noticed these two glaring red eyes. And the Scarberry was one of the witnesses said that uh, they were about uh, size of baseballs, about two inches apart. And then she noticed wings flapped around on its back and she said they reminded her of Angel, Angel's wings. As the car got closer, she said the wings came out and this creature or, or being or whatever ran into one of the, the uh, vacant power plant buildings there called the North Power Plant. And kind of spooked the ladies and they picked up speed and they noticed as they looked behind them uh, that this thing was actually chasing them. That's when this thing came over top of their car. Uh, they were doing 90, 95 miles an hour in, the, in this car coming back to town. And intermittently, this thing would come over the car, then disappear, come over the car. And it chased them back into the city limits, and then it disappeared. And they were thoroughly terrified, but they got home uh, and told their story. And during this time, that started the, the ball rolling on the whole Mothman legend, as it is, one of America's creepiest urban legends. Immediately after the, the two couples saw this thing in the TNT area, they went to the sheriff's department. Now, the sheriff's deputies saw how upset they were. They knew that they, you know, they weren't making this story up. Uh, they sat down and wrote down everything that they encountered. And then the police went up there to investigate. They started running regular patrols. This was on the 15th of November. On the 16th of November, uh, Marcella Bennett and her family actually encountered this thing at, at a house up in the TNT area. Marcella's corroborating evidence makes the community take notice, including her family. I asked my sister what it looked like one day. I said, Marcella, I need to ask you, what does it really look like? Because I was there time after time, but never really got to experience it. And she said, you know what, Carolyn? She said, we were just getting out of the car. We were talking back and forth over top of the car, not paying a lot of attention, not thinking about anything. And I heard something like, shh, shh, shh. And she said, we turned around and looked and it was trying to come through the doors, which they drove trucks and tanks and stuff through them doors, and said that they it wasn't the doors weren't big enough. And I said, well, then how did he get out? And she said he went sideways and came through and flew over top of him. She said, when I looked up and seen them big red eyes, he said, we were out of there. I can't tell you what the rest of it looked like. You can go right down the line through November. You know, there was all kinds of sightings after that. Then the police department started taking it a little more serious. The official record of so many sightings marks a turning point. The residents of Point Pleasant start taking the reports seriously. Many believe something is living near the abandoned munitions plant, something beyond curious, a creature that might actually harm them, and it has a name. The name Mothman was actually given by a, a news reporter during some of those press conferences in the early days of the Mothman uh, sightings. People always ask, well, how did that, how the name Mothman come about? At the time, in the mid-60s, as a little kid, I used to watch the Batman TV series, but there was also the Batman comic book series. There was a character in that comic book series called Mothman. And because people were describing moth-like wings and red eyes, that name Mothman stuck. Now, a lot of local people still to this day refer to it as the Big Bird. Whenever the Mothman was first spotted, uh, it practically covered all of our news areas. It was, it was in the newspaper, big write-ups, and uh, it was on the radio, TV, uh, a word of mouth, everybody was talking about it. I mean, it was, it was different. It was a piece of something that they had never experienced before. You kept your kids in at night, your little ones, you didn't let them out. 
newspaper account came out of a, a big, large, six-foot bird with a large wings, wingspan and red eyes were chasing cars in the TNT area, which caused a mass uh, amount of people to head for the TNT area to see this this massive bird that was out there chasing cars. That's how the story grew. Even some of the news channels picked up on it. That's when everybody came to started coming to Point Pleasant, including John Keel. The late author, John Keel, uh, really spent a lot of time on this whole thing. He's, he stayed there for several months, I believe, or years, doing research for his work. Uh, he took it as premonitions. And I believe that it was 2002 they came out with a film uh, well, based on his book, The Mothman Prophecies. John Keel specialized in writing about extraterrestrials and UFOs. The Mothman Prophecies was published in 1975 and chronicles Keel's extensive research and theories about the Mothman. He believed it was a creature from outer space. When the Mothman was here, things that happened, and it was a little different, and people were scared because, you know, you're a little scared of what you don't know and they didn't communicate with him, didn't know if he was going to hurt anybody. He didn't hurt anybody, but uh, there was an animal killed, but it could have been a coyote. But you didn't know what was going to come up. And people was a little nervous. During the Mothman sightings here in Point Pleasant, they would not let some of the children out for recess because the people didn't know what this thing was. They thought if it was a big bird, it could come down and pick up a little kid and take off with them. So that's how, how paranoid some people were when all this was going on. It was called The Bird. Where, a, a location where a lot of people were, were seeing the Mothman, uh, known as The Bird, uh, was the North Paraplan, and it was generally known as The Bird House. I think it was tore down in the early 90s. It was uh, deemed a health hazard, and then they did tear it down, which is kind of a shame, because it would be like a great landmark. We went up there looking for the Mothman all the time. Don't know what we'd have done if we'd have found him. Uh, I wish I could have said, yes, this is what it looks like. But, you know, it was something to do, and you're curious. And, uh, and we went, but we had carloads. He wasn't going to come out when we were there. Everybody wants a glimpse of the Mothman, be it human, animal, or alien. There are as many local skeptics as believers, but the urban legend grows. And so do the questions. Where did it come from? And why did it choose the munitions depot? What happens next raises even more serious questions. The people of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, are used to seeing peculiar apparitions, but nothing like the mysterious and fearsome Mothman. Soon after it appears, other weird things begin to happen. During this whole period, 1966 to 67, uh, people were reporting strange lights in the sky, so we have the UFO connection. Now, that makes it even more stranger than it already is. There was a lot of UFOs in the area at that time. Did I believe it? No. But we would be, my sister and I would be going to Buffalo and we'd get, come out and look and there'd be beautiful lights in the sky and we'd say, well, the UFOs are out tonight. But did I believe it? No, I didn't. And one landed in my brother's backyard. So then I believed it. He said it was the brightest thing he ever seen. And it couldn't, you couldn't even look at it, it was so bright. And it just picked back up and soared back off just like it come in, no sound. UFOs, Mothman, and strange lights in the night skies over Point Pleasant begin to worry the villagers. Then, events take a bizarre twist. This time, it happens in broad daylight. As soon as people started reporting these uh, uh, Mothman and UFO sightings, people started seeing uh, these so-called men in black. Just like in the movies, you know, the black hats and sunglasses, and they were going around intimidating people saying don't talk about this. They didn't know if they were government agents, if they were law enforcement people, or if they were from another realm. We would see the men in black standing around on the street in the daytime. I mean, if I go to the bank and get change up the street, they'd be standing there staring, just staring. Some of those witnesses started saying, hey, you know, these people are coming to our door and asking us questions and, and telling us not to talk about it to anybody. Uh, the local newspaper reporter, Mary Heyer, said they would come into her office and she didn't know them. They didn't identify themselves, but they were adamant about her not reporting 
these details to the newspaper and to the media. So that started to worry a few people because they didn't know what agenda these, these so-called men in black had, but they weren't real happy about people discussing the UFOs or the Mothman sightings. The men in black hang around Point Pleasant throughout the whole time these strange phenomena are occurring. But who are they? And why are they here? To this day, those questions have never been answered. My brother wanted to come up to the TNT area to look for the Mothman because we'd heard about it that day in school. And we weren't within, I'd say, probably two, three blocks when my brother looked and saw something beside the car on my side of the driver's window. So my brother slammed on the brakes, and when he did, the car kind of turned sideways a little bit in the road. And when we did, that thing just stopped and jumped right onto the hood of the car. And it was just like we were just frozen in time for about I don't know, five seconds, five minutes, 10 minutes, I don't know. Well, it looked through the windshield at us, and we looked at it through the windshield. After it left, my brother turned the car around, and we went straight to the sheriff's department in Point Pleasant. The very next day, soldiers cordoned off all public access to the former munitions plant. So we went back up to the TNT area. There was two or three people standing over there on the side there talking to other military personnel, but they were in suits. So one of them come over here to the car and he just put his hands on the wind. He said, you were told to leave, now leave. Residents are now really concerned about what's going on. They realize these military operations mean serious business. What are they looking for? Once again, more unanswered questions as the mystery deepens. One of John Keel's books, he talks about, it may have been actually, might be multiple prophecies, he talks about window areas, which are like um, parts, like areas of, of uh, land or some, like in various places around the earth and the globe, that uh, they're m more akin to like paranormal activity. And I think that's what uh, Point Pleasant is. There were several people including John Keel, that was receiving uh, prophecies for future events, some of which came through, some of which didn't. Um, there were strange phone calls, and some of these calls involved voices that were giving these prophecies. The Mothman is something that scared a lot of people. I believe, personally, that there was such a creature I don't think, however, it was a UFO. I don't think it was an occupant from a, another planet. That is partially the belief system for a lot of people. Small town in the 60s, they didn't have all the lights and the glitz and the technology, so they simply would have enjoyed these stories, and it would have excited them and scared them. And fear can generate all kinds of responses. The people of this once quiet village turned to local Native American history and legends for an explanation as to what may be happening. Some people felt that that went back years ago to an to a Indian curse that w uh, was bestowed on the town of Point Pleasant by an Indian Chief Cornstalk. Uh, what happened was is Chief Cornstalk and his son both were murdered over a land dispute over, you know, with some settlers. And the story went that up, up on his dying breath, he cursed the town of Point Pleasant for the next 200 years. Uh, some people do believe that. But Chief Cornstalk did exist, uh, his son, and they, and they both were killed. Now, whether or not he did put that curse on the town of Point Pleasant remains a mystery. Of course, everything that happened, if we had uh, uh, a wreck happened, it was either Cornstalk or Mothman. Uh, if we had uh, a FAR or a power outage, or uh, mainly their power outages and stuff like that, they contributed to, to Mothman. As far as the Mothman goes, I, I believe it's just something we haven't discovered yet, or something that did exist and may have died. It's something natural. 
is what the bottom line is. Now, the supernatural element, is, as romantic and uh, as elegant as it is, will be very, very hard to prove. While the residents of Point Pleasant try to connect all the dots and make sense of the strange things going on around them, no one could have predicted what happens next. In November of 1966, you know, the Mothman sightings began, the UFO activity, the men in black, uh, all this was, was going on at the same time. Apparently, people were getting thought patterns, like something bad is gonna happen, something really terrible. People are having dreams, um, seeing presents floating in the water and so forth. Really weird, bizarre dreams, but they didn't take it to heart, really, because they just figured it was just a weird dream. In December of 1967, uh, December 15th, the Silver Bridge, which was a 40-year-old bridge right here in downtown Point Pleasant, collapsed uh, on a Friday evening during rush hour, uh, killed 46 people. This event brought more attention to Point Pleasant, besides the, the Mothman sightings. Some people felt that it was just a very odd timing to the Mothman activity and the UFO activity. They felt that there may have been some sort of a connection. Obviously, the it was a terrible tragedy. The, the, we knew most of the people that went down on the bridge. In fact, the, the parents of the mayor at that time was, was, were on the bridge. Uh, a little girl that was in my classroom was on the bridge with, with her parents. Some people f claimed to have seen a large bird flying back and forth across the river days before that bridge fell. There were other people that reported seeing men dressed in black clothing climbing up and down on that bridge. Now, whether those sightings or reports can be validated is, is another story, but people did come forth and say that. A controlled group conscious, if you will, is something where a group of people can see something, or one person will see it, and then another person will see it, and then it will go down in that group, in that community, whatever it is. It's definitely real. We saw it, I saw it too. Then it becomes hysteria. So in a small community, sure. I saw it, you saw it, it's real. And they're gonna stick by that. It almost becomes a religious experience. Now another aspect to that is the belief system. Once you believe in something so, so strongly, it will stay with you over years and years and years. And even something that didn't really occur or something that was mis misunderstood will still be just as strong 40, 50 years later. Because they're gonna remember it exactly the way they experienced it. They saw something that was very frightening to them and fascinating. A lot of those people were not real thrilled about seeing it. Uh, they didn't, uh, some of them would not even go out at nighttime. You know, they, they became reclusive. Um, they felt that something was always looking over their shoulder or in their area of, of where they were, very paranoid. They didn't really like the attention they were getting from, from the townspeople because people th thought they were crazy or, you know, loony or whatever. And that's why a lot of those witnesses, even to this day, will not discuss it. They won't admit that it didn't happen. They, they will tell me it did happen. They saw it with their own eyes, but that's, that's all they want to say about it. Jeff has always been interested in strange phenomena. His obsession with the mysterious Mothman took root in childhood. He's spent years accumulating enough evidence to fill his Mothman museum. That makes him a leading authority on the creature and where it's likely to be seen. Okay, these, these structures have been here for well over 60 years. They're relatively untouched. As you can see all the detail on these, you, you can actually walk underneath you know, look underneath, and, and they're very eerie, especially at night, especially when the fog starts setting out here. They're basically the same as they were back during World War II. When the war ended, uh, they just left everything. They never tore anything down. And uh, during the Mothman sightings, you know, a lot of people thought that whatever this thing was, 
was either roosting or staying in this, this general area up here in the TNT area. of the Silver Bridge a year after the first Mothman sightings shocks the residents of Point Pleasant. Engineers offer plausible explanations about why the 40-year-old bridge collapsed, but some people aren't so sure. They link the tragedy to unnatural causes. Some people say that the uh, Mothman had something to do with the Silver Bridge falling. My answer to that is the Silver Bridge fell because of a cracked eye bar. There was one eye bar that was uh, prior to the uh, Ohio uh, Tower on the bridge. It cracked and that is what caused the bridge to fall. Now, the 13th pin, strangely enough, that held the bridge together, and scientifically speaking, or engineer, from an engineer's point of view, when they did test on the bridge after the accident, after it collapsed, they said that it was no wonder it didn't collapse earlier. It was old bridge, it was out of date, it needed to be changing. That's a matter of record. The fact that it was the 13th pin that went added, you know, another supernatural element to it. And it's great for the urban legend. It, it adds to it, makes it, it adds to the mystery. There are other people who say that the uh, Mothman was a, sort of a, an omen of the bridge falling. I don't know where they got that idea. Well, in the 60s, they had very bad, very poor, or it was just neglect in their uh, disposal of some of the byproducts of that uh, TNT factory. So it got into the aquifer. And the aquifer is the main water source, and they would have used it. And even though they may have had purification processes, which I'm sure got, gets out a lot of the uh, pollutants and carcinogens and what have you, some of it may have gotten through and may have caused a hallucinogenic effect. If, possibly, if the ground was saturated with some kind of unknown pollutant that caused a hallucinogenic effect, and you saw a true-life cryptozoological cryptid creature, you're going to start seeing all kinds of different things. And what looked, what is going to be totally natural to uh, a biologist or an ornithologist or something like that, even with their amazement to people like you and me who's never seen these things before, it's going to be frightening. I believe there's a lot of things that I just don't understand. And with that, I take it with a grain of salt, but I don't discredit what people are saying they're seeing. Many theories have been presented to justify or debunk the existence of Mothman. One comes from an unofficial branch of science known as cryptozoology. What do I think it is? I think uh, it does belong, the, the creature itself, belong in the realm of cryptozoology. I think that uh, crypto meaning it's something different, something out of place, not natural to be found. And every once in a while, nature spits out something that shouldn't be there. And I think this is one such case. There were uh, several eyewitness descriptions and accounts of some of these Mothman sightings that pointed towards the possibility of, of it being maybe a thunderbird or a prehistoric bird. Um, I had actually talked to one lady who saw it in, in daylight in the TNT area, and she described it as a prehistoric bird. Some people felt that, that the Mothman may have actually been a thunderbird or something extinct. It's like any other crypto-type monster, like the Bigfoot legend, or in, or in the state of Florida, the skunk ape, or something like that. Many people say, yes, absolutely exist. We've seen it. We don't know what it is. Why aren't we catching these things? You'd think they would leave some kind of evidence. Uh, you know, well, what about a body? You know, anthropologists and, and archaeologists, they need these things, empirical data, to, to believe in it. And without that, it's going to remain in the realm of folklore or, or myth. 
Another theory suggests Mothman might be the result of some radical mutation of a life form exposed to radiation. I wish there were a lot more supernatural creatures who would make life more interesting. But I think in this case, it was just something that existed, uh, does exist still, and occasionally came out of there. He could have been mutated. It could have been mutated by that particular area, which was the grounds are poisoned. They still are even to this day. The EPA is trying to clean that up. Sometimes, uh, like if you remember the old bee monster movies, you know, they, they got radiation or something that gets gigantic and what have you. In most cases, radiation just kills, pure and simple. But every once in a while, it alters DNA. It alters growth patterns and so forth in plants and in people. You know, after uh, uh, World War II, you can find all kinds of different effects from radiation for those who survived. Uh, frightening effects that make humans look non-human. So this could happen in nature too. And I think that's also a credible possibility. I think after the Silver Bridge collapsed, the, the whole town was in a state of shock. I mean, they'd never seen a disaster, you know, on that, that scale of, you know, 46 people, uh, you know, perishing in a, in a bridge disaster. It was the worst, worst bridge disaster in, in American history, still, still is. But I think it, it you know, it, it's, there was so much going on. People had a hard time um, absorbing all of the, the activity and the attention. But, you know, people still, you know, we're in the TNT area, you know, years and years, even to this day. It's, it's really difficult to, to say that, that that book will ever be closed on, you know, what this Mothman or large bird actually was. That's the whole beauty of the, the Mothman stories. People are always looking for answers. Mothman will probably always be around. I think the idea of this creature will always be around. It may indeed be something from the realms of complete supernatural, and it may blow our socks off someday by presenting itself. Maybe it is an alien life. I can't discount that. My personal belief system is that it's just a misidentification. It's a great story, though. I think if, if 20 years ago, somebody would have came forth and said, this is what it was, here's the proof, here's the documentation, book closed. You know, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. We just don't know until it dies in the woods and the forestry department picks it up and it becomes news and it goes in the classroom school books, it's gonna remain the monster that we know it is today. Whether Mothman is fact or fiction, horror or hoax, the creature towers over the daily life of Point Pleasant. Instead of ridicule, the Mothman book and movie has brought fame and fortune to this little village on the Ohio River. The movie changed things by putting us out there, putting Point Pleasant on the map. A big part of the climatic part of the movie is the bridge falling. Then now everyone wants to ask you about the Mothman, and, and anywhere you travel, if you're from Point Pleasant, always the first thing someone asks you about is, is the Mothman. But people had a hard time seeing that movie in town. Uh, it, it's hard to watch that bridge fall, and it's hard to watch the, the Mothman parts about it. When that movie came out, the floodgates just opened, and you know the, the town was just overrun. You know, people coming here. You know, they wanted to go where the, uh, you know, the, this actually happened. I knew right then that it, it, would, it would change the town. But you know, uh, whether you believe in the Mothman or not, it's done a lot for Point Pleasant. Mothman Festival is the single biggest attractor from throughout the country and the world than we have in, here in Point Pleasant. You can't 
drive down Main Street because it's full of people. And they come from all over the world. I, we've had people from China, Australia, Japan, England. They come from every place to come to this Mothman Festival. After the movie, The Mothman Prophecies came out. Jeff and Carolyn Harris came up with this idea that we should have a festival each year to bring all of the people that would be interested in something like that. I was talking to Carolyn one day and I said, you know, um, we ought to try maybe a Mothman festival or a convention, something like that. That's, this was in November of 2002. This was just months after the movie came out. And we, we decided to give it a go. We decided like in October of that year to have it. So we only had a month. We didn't advertise. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't really get it out to the media much, but we had four or 500 people just show up by word of mouth. And that was the catalyst for what now is the 12th year of the Mothman Festival. And we have speakers at the State Theater. We have entertainment on the Riverfront Park. And sometimes we have karaoke contests. We've had a weightlifting contest there. Uh, we have a lot of vendors out here, a lot of souvenirs. We have a witness panel that we pay to sit there and answer questions. People want to ask them in direct, for sure. You know, what did you see? They want to ask them. They like that uh, out there. And we try to add something every year. We have a, a 5K race. We have a big uh, Mothman beauty pageant. From the Mothman, glowing red eyes, 10 feet tall, baby, that's no lie. In the Mothman Festival pageant, we have moth wear, which is where contestants wear jeans, and then they are to incorporate the color green into their outfit. And we get wings sometimes. Contestants have wings. Sometimes uh, contestants just they want to show their personality so they're real stylish and upbeat. Um, they also compete in evening gown and on stage question. And what the judges usually try to look for is just a natural girl who is just wanting to really promote the Mothman Festival pageant and not just be after the crown and sash, but actually to promote the festival. I won in 2010. It was really actually quite surprising because I'd never done a pageant before, so I was really nervous. And I'd always liked the Mothman and all that stuff. So I thought, hey, why not? Let's try it. And then lo and behold, I won, which was absolutely insane. But the uh, pageant was actually really cool. Like we got to learn the Mothman dance, which was really fun. Mothman, he's not from Japan. He's genuine American. <laughs> People come from all over the world, literally, and that's why we call it the world's only Mothman Museum. But we have props, we have very rare archives, we had a lot of John Keel memorabilia, we carry merchandise, and we started, uh, you know, just opening two or three days a week. Now we're open seven days a week. And we're knowledgeable, people want to come in and, and ask us questions. We show documentaries and things like that. I really enjoy being a tour guide. I meet people from all over the world. It's really cool. We can take them up to the area, let them see everything as far as different sites of Point Pleasant, um, tell them different stories um, that I've been told throughout the years about the Mothman and all the different encounters with him. Stories I've actually heard from the eyewitnesses themselves. Then we get out and we check out the igloos and look at the first uh, where the first sighting was. Um, it's really, really entertaining. I enjoy it. Igloos are storage bunkers made of cement where ammunition was stored during the Second World War. Although there were never really actually any Mothman sightings reported in, in the igloos, it's still a fascinating part, a fascinating part of the history of the TNT area. Uh, as you can see, the four foot thick walls. A lot of paranormal groups frequent the, the igloos because they, you know, they want to try to catch the orbs and different pictures and, and things like that. So it's, uh, it's a vital part of the Mothman history and uh, I think it needs to be researched a, a little more.
It's been nearly 50 years since the Mothman and the Men in Black spooked a little village in West Virginia. But how things have changed. From the town's worst nightmare, Mothman has become a dream come true and a symbol of pride and joy for everyone. The Mothman is, is, is such a creature that uh, it's hard not to look at. He's, he sort of takes after Loch Ness Monster and, and Bigfoot, but I think ours is a little more exciting because he, uh, he just shows up everywhere and there's so much, uh, so many stories behind him that it's changed our town. One of the main attractions here in downtown Point Pleasant is the world famous uh, Mothman statue. That statue came about uh, two, three years after the movie was released and a local artist who works in stainless steel uh, named Bob Roach created that uh, statue after sitting down with some of the, Mo the Mothman witnesses and uh, eyewitnesses and things like that. And he came, his, came to his own you know, version of that Mothman. But people all over the world come to get their picture taken with that, uh, that statue. We unveiled the statue in a, in a ceremony that attracted national news. Uh, CBS Sunday morning came and it shocked all of us. We thought it would just be a few people from around town and maybe a couple local stations. But uh, we immediately went on national TV when, when the statue was unveiled. It's a really uh, nice piece of, of artwork, you know, and a lot of detail and things like that. But it's, it's a nice centerpiece to, to, to let people know, you know, what all happened here. Mothman is a big part of the history of Point Pleasant. There's other pieces of history, too. We have a Mothman tram that run, goes around through town. You can board it out here, and it'll take you to all of our entities that we have, uh, River Museum, behind the flood wall for the murals, uh, the Silver Bridge Memorial, uh, anything, anything we have, the Fort Randolph going on, but the tram will take you to show you that we have more than just Mothman. We have the history and the mystery. Families come from all over. Groups come, bus tours come, governors come and get their picture taken with the Mothman. It's not a true uh, visit to Point Pleasant unless you get your picture taken with the Mothman. I don't know how to explain it, but they're here every day, just about all year long. I don't care if it's raining, snowing, or what, there's people getting their picture taken with the Mothman. It's, it's really been a phenomenon that uh, you would never think about, but it's here. I can't say for sure whether it's real or not. Uh, I just know that there's a tremendous amount of evidence uh, that it is. We invite everybody to come here. We we'll take them and, and show them all, all the different uh, attractions that are geared, geared towards it and we'll let them make up their mind for themselves. The Mothman is a big thing with a lot of people. Uh, it's kind of put Point Pleasant on the map in most recent years. And people come just because they've heard of it. And it's sort of mysterious. And they want to see what it looks like. The, we have the statue in, in town. And um, so that's something that's visible to them, you know. We have so much American history here. We have a lot of agricultural history. Obviously, we have paranormal history. Plus, we just like having visitors. It, we, we really enjoy the people that come. Uh, everyone in town gets out and speaks to everyone, and uh, they get out on Main Street and sit in their rocking chairs and, and talk to all the folks that come in. It's, it's a perfect way to get people to come to Point Pleasant and, and then have a look around, and they may find something else they didn't know about. The people with the Mothman, they're never going to stop coming. We know that, and, and uh, we, we enjoy all the different ones that come. Welcome to Tennessee in the southeastern United States. Day or night, the state is home to all genres of music. 
From bluegrass to country, Delta blues to rock and roll. The legendary clubs along Beale Street in Memphis were among the first to feature Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash. Nashville, the state capital, is also the capital of country music recording. But something that's frequently overlooked by visitors who come for the entertainment are the mountains and fertile plains of rural Tennessee. About 40 miles or 60 kilometers north of Nashville lies this quaint little town of Adams. Population 628. Visitors can expect to be treated to legendary southern hospitality. But this peaceful setting is better known for something sinister. 200 years ago, apparitions and horrific events tormented a local family. Even today, some descendants feel they're still being shadowed by an evil spirit. Beginning 196 years ago, bells were tormented by what they called a spirit, the neighbors called a witch, some people called a demon. In the legend, John Bell was poisoned by the spirit who calls herself Kate. Many things have been seen inside the local caves. Folks believe that spirits, orbs, even ghosts sometimes can be heard talking. I have friends who have gone out there. They conceal the presence of the witch. And when I went downstairs, I saw a ghost behind the stove. I'm convinced something very, very bad was in that house. And some believe it was trapped between two worlds, between the earth and the spirit world. What it was, we really don't know. The, the spirit was asked, where, where, where did you come from? Who are you and where did you come from? And he said, I am a spirit and I have been disturbed. I've been around for millions of years. It had to be something very powerful to do what it did, but it never, it never led on to what it actually was. They didn't understand why it was coming after our family. And when it was asked about why it was coming after the Bell family, or after John, and the spirit said he just needs killing. People in the area continue to claim to see sightings of the Bell Witch. They claim to hear her in the middle of the night. They hear the sounds of um, things in the house or maybe in the woods, and they will attribute that to the Bell Witch. But it's, it's supposed to be an etern eternal spirit. And, uh, you know, most people look at it as some kind of witch riding around on a broom, but that's not how it's ever described by the bells. They always describe it as a voice or an entity, and they claim they could see from time to time. Some, it, it exhibited itself as either an animal or a, a human being. Now, the neighbors always heard the voices, but many of them said they did not see the form that it sometimes manifested according to legend. Well, you have your believers and you have your non-believers, and with that comes ex the extent of in uh, both areas. You have some that are very hardcore. Um, I, I don't believe in ghosts. I will not ever admit that there's a bell witch. And then you have the people who really believe that she existed and that she tormented this bell family for years and that she continues to torment people in Robertson County as they visit Adams. Supposedly one of the sons of, uh, Brit of John Bell had served with Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson came back and had a confrontation with this entity. Andrew Jackson had a pleasant encounter with it, but it abused people that he was with. And he, he was quoted as saying he'd rather face the whole of the British Army as to face the Bell Witch again. Well, now it showed up as several different things in the story. It was a, like a, a, a turkey, a wolf, a little girl in a swing that when Betsy tried to talk to her, she disappeared. The details of these hauntings aren't for the faint of heart. For nearly two centuries, the Bell Witch has fascinated and puzzled followers of the paranormal. Fear is constantly being evoked by fireside storytellers, books, a play, and even a Hollywood movie. According to history, John Bell's death was attributed to a spirit, and it's the only person I know in, in the history of the United States whose death was attributed to, to a spirit. 
The legend of the Bell Witch has been passed down from generation to generation in the town of Adams, Tennessee. And it's gone viral. It has all the elements of a classic ghost story, an old haunted house, furniture moving on its own, eerie sounds and strange voices that come from nowhere. It's more than enough to convince anyone their home is possessed. Let me tell you a little bit about the Bell House. In 1817, according to legend, the Bells began to experience phenomenon they called the spirit. The neighbors called it a witch, and it began to torment the family, in particular, John Bell and his youngest daughter, Betsy. John Bell had a lot of health problems, and they blamed that on the spirit. He lost his shoes at times. They just literally fly off his feet, and they'd have to retrieve them. Betsy was slapped, uh, had her covers removed at various times, had her hair tied in knots around the bedpost. Betsy seemed to be targeted more than the other children and would have experiences during the night of being slapped being pinched, her hair being torn. She would scream out in the middle of the night and the family would see to her. When visitors would come and spend the night to see if these stories were actually true, they too would experience this. John at times could not talk. It was as if he had a stick crossways of his mouth and then he would get better. This went on for about two or three years until finally on the 19th of December, 1820, John Bell became extremely sick. Uh, the doctor was called, and it was determined that he had been poisoned. They were beginning to wonder who did this. Did uh, somebody in the family poison John Bell? Uh, did Betsy do this? Did the neighbor do this? And all of a sudden, they hear the voice that they've heard so often in the house. And the spirit, as they call it, said, I killed old John. I fixed his medicine last night, gave him a big dose of it, and he'll never get up out of that bed. And John Bell died. <laughs> I've come to the conclusion that something definitely did happen. I've, I've seen a letter, a handwritten letter from 1820, the year John died, of two boys uh, riding home to their mother on their trip to see the angel at the bell house. And they were able to get to the house and the first night, they said nothing happened. And the second night it happened and said, mom, it's not an angel, it's the devil. And this is part of the legend that continues on through the years. The Bell family is still here in Robertson County, and it has a bloodline that exists till t to today. And because of that, the story just keeps getting passed generation to generation and is kept alive. Bob Bell is one of those descendants. He has no doubts his family's stories are true. Like his fifth great-grandfather, John, Bob has also been a target inside his own home. I had just gotten ready to get in the bed, and everything was quite really quiet then. And then I heard at the end of that hall, the double door slammed shut, both doors. And one of them latches, so they had to be unlatched and they had to slam them shut. And there was footsteps came down the hall and stopped at my door and the hair on my neck stood up. And me not being superstitious, I, I thought somebody was in the house. You know, I, I thought we had an intruder and I was, I was truly scared. Probably, that's probably the most scared I've ever been. So I went downstairs, I went to our gun cabinet and found a 45. I loaded it, put it around in the chamber, and I had it cocked. I was going to shoot somebody. <laughs> Cause, and I went room to room, SWAT team style, and, and took me about a half hour to go through the whole house because there's two sets of stairs. And I went back and forwards and looked everywhere in that house. There was nobody there. And I slept with the door locked, pistol by the bed, and my light on. Many people believe the Bell Witch that stalked John Bell and his family isn't just an old legend. It's still around. Other people in Adams and Robertson County also have had close encounters with the spirit. Most happen inside a network of caves, once used for cold storage by farmers in the region. These dark, out-of-the-way caves can be dangerous places, but are perfect locations for paranormal activity. Cave explorers and casual visitors are warned not to enter unprepared. The most popular cave in the area is the one on the old Bell family farm. Most visitors who go there won't cross paths with the Bell Witch or any other spirit, but they could end up even worse off, cornering a wild animal in its lair. Many of our local ghost stories have begun in caves. Voices, orbs, just about anything you can name have been supposedly heard. And a few years ago, in the last 15 or 20 years, somebody captured a picture outside the mouth of a cave here, and uh, it looked to be a woman dressed in a white dress. 
showed up in the film, but it wasn't in the picture when they took it. Betsy Bell and the Bell children often played in the cave that was on their farm. They claimed at times to have had something chasing them. <laughs> and so the story of a giant fish just below the cave that stirred up the water and caused the Bell children to be greatly alarmed. Uh, on a trip from the river and from the cave one day, Betsy saw a little girl hanging from the tree and she talked to Betsy and uh, told her that she shouldn't marry her boyfriend, Joshua Gardner. So caves are so important to the legend and the story of the Bell Witch in Robinson County. Uh, I was teaching a local history class for Volunteer State Community College. And the guy that owned the cave, he asked me if I had ever been to the cave, which I had not. And so we go down to the cave and we go about 250 feet back and I got up on this ledge with this gentleman to see some Indian drawings or whatever, and the lights go out. And this is 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and I have 10 or 11 history students in there. So we grope ourselves back out of the cave, and we get to the entrance of the cave. The lights come back on. Now, my son, who was let's say 79, so say about six or seven years old, I wouldn't let him go. So I made him stay with the lady upstairs. So I assumed that he, she had done something with the light. He said she didn't move. Pioneer and farmer John Bell is buried here in the Bellwood Cemetery, along with many of his descendants. The place is popular with tourists who come to find out more about the family tormented over nearly two centuries by the Bell Witch. But John Bell's tombstone seen here isn't original. Following an old custom at the time of his death, he would have been buried in the forest. Eventually, many of those early grave sites disappeared. I was going to try to document where people lived at the time because so much of it is, is it's destroyed. I was trying to find one person, the grave. His name was Frank Miles, and in, in the story, he plays a part uh, as being a, a neighbor and he and John Bell Jr. were close personal friends. I walked the countryside trying to find the gravesite. Couldn't do it. One morning about three o'clock, it was in July, I woke up, I'd had a dream. And I dreamed about a small grove of trees. And I couldn't get that away from my mind. It just, I kept going right back to it. And about the middle of the morning, I thought, I know where that is. So I was, I went in this place and it's grown over with poison ivy and honeysuckle. So I cut all the uh, vegetation away and scraped the dirt off of it. And I had on a glove and so I rubbed it off and it said Frank R. Miles. I gently put it back down, covered it back over and left. I thought, this is, this is not normal. At that point I thought, you know, some things are better left alone, so just leave it alone. So I stopped my pursuit of locating where all anyone else was buried. Just, I was coming home one night, and me and my kids, and there was this, I don't know what it was, I can't tell you, it wasn't a cat, it wasn't a panther, it wasn't a dog, but I was driving, and this animal come toward my car, and it was pure black and had red eyes. That's all I can tell you. Don't know what it was. I'd never seen anything like it before. And it just kind of come toward me and then darted off and I never saw nothing of it. Our phone rang and it was my grandmother who was really distraught and she talked to my father and she wanted him to come down as soon as possible. We went into the house and I remember grandmother still holding the phone and seeing how scared she was. She said, well, I was upstairs taking a nap and I heard this crash, this loud noise. And I came downstairs and then came into the kitchen and I looked in, on the floor and all my china was on the kitchen floor. Well, the odd part about it was there's a butler's pantry between the kitchen and the dining room that had the china cabinet built into the wall with latching doors. And the doors came open and all the china, every single piece came out and crashed on the floor, not in the butler's pantry, but in the kitchen. And it was, I just remember seeing it spread just evenly, like it was just thrown out on the floor. And not one piece was broken, and it was, and it was bone china. So it was, 
I have no explanation of how that happened or why it happened, but it, it was uh, still unexplained by anybody today. And anybody who goes up there looking for the Bell Witch will find the Bell Witch. In the final chapters of Pat Fitzhugh's book, he talks about his visit out to the graveyard where, where uh, the family, some of the family had been buried. And he talks about ha having this feeling of a presence out there, out at the graveyard. He's not the only one. There is also some kids that had gone out there and had, had found the gravestone of John Bell, and they were bringing the dang gone thing back in their car, and they had an accident out on the main road, and they, they died in that accident. Again, the story is it was the witch that, was, uh, that, that went after them. The legend of the Bell Witch has been detailed in some 20 books. It's the most extensively studied case of a haunted house in American history. One of the better known works was written in 1894 by Martin Ingram, a Tennessee journalist. And about three years before he wrote the book, in the Nashville Banner, he did write a letter that anybody that knew anything on the subject of the Bell family or the Bell Witch to write him letters and testimonies. And he went around the, the, the entire countryside in, in Montgomery, Robertson, and Adams, all through that area, and got a lot of information and testimonies on people that had, had heard about the legend or actually even knew the bells. The story that Ingram tells is he got, the, he got a copy of the diary that was written by Richard Bell, which was, who is Elizabeth Bell's younger brother. At the time that this event had occurred in Adams, Tennessee, Richard was about six to seven years old. Richard then, 20 years later, sits down and decides he, wrote, he wants to write a diary. So he writes a diary and he titled it, My, Fam My Family's Troubles. He gives his diary to his son. His son then, about 20 years later, brings this diary to uh, Marvin Ingram with the stipulation that they could do nothing with the diary until all the family had died off. All the first generation family had died off. The closest to the legend is in Ingram's book because he interviewed people within the same um, era who were related to people who used to live in the time when the actual legend took place. A lot of folks really kind of consider the first book by Ingram kind of the Bell Witch Bible, if you will. And uh, I don't know why. I, I know the Ingram book is older. Perhaps that's why. Ingram was a very good writer. He was a newspaper publisher, and he wrote in the style of his day, which was in the 1890s. Sometimes a little bit prejudiced, but uh, in general, he's a very good writer. Okay, and the, and the book is basically filled on stories that happened to the Bell family that they started hearing strange noises and they started seeing strange animals, and John Bell would shoot at them, and nothing would happen, or they would run off. And it talks about John Bell later on being killed by the witch. Several other books follow and help feed the growing legend. Newer reports of alleged witch sightings and other eyewitness accounts win over more believers. Then, a few members of the Bell family come up with a new theory about the hauntings. In a book published in 1934, Dr. Charles Bailey Bell, John's grandson, says that his grandfather came to Tennessee from North Carolina under a cloud of suspicion. People like the Bell family who, who, were, my, who were farmers, they began to move into this area because of the land and the fertilization of the land. Uh, we we're almost certain that they did raise tobacco. There was a church that was established in North Carolina and it moved here and primarily all the people that was in that church came here with the church. 
And John Bell was a member of Red River Baptist Church, and he was excommunicated, which I didn't know the Baptists did, but he was. And uh, he was kicked out of the church for a term called usury. John Bell is a wealthy man, but how he comes by his fortune and conducts his business affairs raises a lot of eyebrows in Robertson County. They were a prominent family in North Carolina when they moved in here. Uh, I've often wondered why did John Bell, I think at the age of 56, if he was successful back there and had a going farm or plantation, why would you leave and move in here and start fresh again? And there's several stories on basically what he did or what he was accused of is that some say it was for sell of a horse, sell of land, sell of a slave, or something like this. He bought it from the Batts family, and Kate felt she was cheated in, in the purchase. Kate felt cheated by the Bells, and that she played a role in uh, the actual um, experience of the Bell Witch. Um, the Bell Witch actually uses a voice, which not all ghosts do. Uh, and she refers to herself as Kate. And so that takes you back to Kate Batts. And we're not really for certain if Kate Batts was the witch or not. You know, that, uh, you know she's, the witch says that she was. And basically, the, you know, this book right here was, was written by Ingram. And, um, but we don't know if he ever got to interview any of the Batts family or any of that. The ghost could be Kate. It could be Kate because this is, the person that had an antagonistic relationship with John Bell. Um, a lot of people think that it, it is Kate because the ghost would use the voice and whenever she would speak, she would refer to herself as Kate. Although there is nothing to indicate that that happened. In fact, the, oftentimes they say that Kate Batts was the witch. The only trouble is Kate Batts was alive at the time. So it's not likely that uh, she had anything to do with it. And the, also, the other thing I found in research is she didn't really hold a grudge anyway. That's a, it's, it's a good question. How, the, how Kate fit into it all, since as you pointed out, she wasn't dead when these manifestations started happening. There's no evidence that she cursed him, that she felt cheated by him, that was at best a distant relative of hers. So I think this is just uh, probably pretty typical for the way legends develop. Back then, I think superstition probably played a very important role, is that in the early escorts of man or escapades of man, is that if you can't explain it, it must be something we've done to upset God, so therefore we won't do that anymore if we can find out what it was we didn't do to begin with. So therefore, this is how they explain many of the actions was through superstition. The dramatic story of the Bell Witch is made to order for actors. Every year in the fall, some of Tennessee's best performers come together to recount the horrific legend of the most famous haunted house in America. Thrills and chills guaranteed. And for the play, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, we have local artists there. We have a lot of talent is in this neighborhood, a lot of talent. I hear in 2006, there was about a thousand in attendance to that play, which runs two or three weekends in a row. And this past year in 2012, there was 1,600 who visited, so it's really increased. They changed the story up from year to year. They have different characters in it, um, different cast members, and they'll try to focus on different aspects of the legend. And usually involves at least some of the Bell family, and occasionally they'll have a Bats family related to the Bats in, in the play. But it's so good, they're so professional. Uh, uh, we've had people come there from like maybe New York, and they say, you know, the plays there are not any better than our plays here. Well, curiosity seekers will come and they will experience the Bell Witch by going to the play's spirit. And whenever they go out there to Adams and watch the play, sometimes they'll have things happen to them that they will attribute to the Bell Witch. 
And that's why they come here in the first place a lot of times, because people are fascinated with this story. And the fact that it has gone through the years and lasted as long as it has, is just fascinating to people. And when they do come and they do experience the play and then maybe visit some of the sites, they might have some things happen to them that they might think is from the paranormal. And uh, whether it's the paranormal, who's to say? The Bell Witch legend keeps the town of Adams on the map. Recent phenomena still have people believing, and so the legend lives on. When I came being an outsider, I was a non-believer. They're little vaporous orbs that can be seen. They couldn't see it was a person. They just could see some movement and a little light. But I've only been in the cave one time that night that the lights went out. And there's this lady that came, and she was going to do a seance. I have no desire to go back in it. And yes, true, I am a believer. We have not seen them, but we have been told by two different people. Uh, one who was up here, uh, who had never been here before, and said, well, I saw this little cloud going from the cemetery to the, the uh, second floor of your house. And we also ran into another man who grew up on this road as a child and said he was never so scared in his life and saw the same thing. What should one make of those wispy clouds often spotted in this part of Tennessee? Fog is relatively common in the region. Great Smoky Mountains National Park is just a five-hour drive from Adams. The park gets its name from the fog that often drifts down from the high mountains. It's home to bears and deer, but no recorded sightings of a ghost or even the bell witch. So why do people claim strange things are still happening in Tennessee? Like many legends and ghost stories, they tend to morph over time, uh, especially if people have an incentive. And I'm not going to talk about any, I'm not going to make any allegations, but there's money to be made here. Marvin Ingram started a newspaper in Springfield, Tennessee, and then moved his newspaper up to, get to Clarksville. And uh, the two of them ran the paper. Thomas was the, uh, the reporter and Ingram was the promoter. Uh, they had gotten into, at that time, a kind of the liars group. And the whole thing was a, who could tell the most fantastic story. Well, you can never discount lying. People lie for a lot of reasons. And, and some people like attention. Some people want to believe. So there's always that. When Marvin Ingram wrote his book, on the back part of his book, he's got a list of all the people he talked to and interviewed for this book. You have to go back to where do we even know about the story? We know about the story from Ingram. He talked to nobody who had ever been involved directly with the Bell Witches. He talked only to people who knew people who were involved. In my opinion, it could have been nothing. In my opinion, that story could have totally been made up. He never talked with uh, Elizabeth. He never talked with any of the family and never even talked with the, uh, the boy, uh, Richard Bell, who wrote the, the diary. They refused to part with the diary until Betsy was dead. And I thought to myself, that's really slick because now with Betsy out of the picture and they give the diary, she's not there to interview, to verify, not verify. So, but again, we go back to this assumes the diary even existed. Nobody has even seen the diaries. There's no reason to believe Ingram couldn't have made everything up other than the fact that these people did exist, the Bell family did exist. It is reported by uh, Marvin Ingram that Andrew Jackson visited the site. Now, Andrew Jackson visited after he had just done the New Orleans, you know, the conquest down there. He defeated the, the uh, British in New Orleans. Well, the thing, the story about him coming into town and his wagon not moving and on and on, whenever that was reported to have happened, I mean, he was president. People knew where he was, and he wasn't there. Anything that man would have done would have been written down in great detail. Okay, I have searched his journals. Everybody, others have searched his journals. There is absolutely no mention whatsoever in his journals of ever having been 
to Adams, Tennessee, not without alone having, uh, having confronted the witch. I mean, the, the way this legend has developed, it's got a little bit of everything. You know, they've thrown in poltergeist stuff, they've thrown in witch stuff, ghost stuff, bad witch, good witch. There's religion thrown in, you know, so that's a good way to get people to believe. You know, put something in there that they can relate to, and they might ignore the rest, but they'll believe the legend if it has something that speaks to them. Kids all around Robertson County and Middle Tennessee hear about the Bell Witch as they grow up. And not only do they hear it from family and friends when they're younger, but when they do enter the school system, sometimes it will be interjected into their curriculum. What I would do is I would write something on a piece of paper, as inane as it is or something like this, and the rule of the game was is that the first person in this class row read it and tried to memorize it. And then I took the piece of paper and then the rules of the game is you turn around and you tell the person behind you exactly what you read. And that went all the way around the room until the last person. Now that last person's job was to come up and write on the board exactly what they heard. It never, ever started out or ended up the same. So therefore, I said, okay, now we have established the rules for telling the Bell Witch stories. Well, found footage is a well-known technique in fiction. It's used in literature. It's used a lot in sci-fi. But the way it, things are set up is someone stumbles upon a relic, photos, diary, film, whatever, that depicts something that supposedly happened. We all know about the Blair Witch Project. You know, they found these uh, videos of allegedly what happened in the woods. We know the Blair Witch Project is fiction, but what we've got here is the diary is kind of the found footage. Of course, they didn't have videos back then. So we've got Ingram, who allegedly has this source that isn't even that good, but that's another topic. But we, unlike the Blair Witch Project, he doesn't even have the diary. Everyone has heard of a ghost, a haunted house, or a paranormal event at least once in their lives. Most of us either accept or reject the reports based on the evidence. In the case of the Bell Witch, no one can say for sure what actually happened 200 years ago near the quiet village in Tennessee. Or why sightings continue to this day. A few people have theories. Bo was in the, uh, was in the um, um, Bell Witch cave, which is, sometimes is open to the public and sometimes it isn't. And uh, sometimes around Halloween, they used to say that they would have people to come and they'd, uh, they'd have things happening, you know, to excite people. So one time, Bo was there. He's a friend of the owner, and he was there taking some pictures back in the cave. And there's this lady that came, and she was going to do a seance with a couple of photographers and everything. And she saw Bo in the background, but she didn't see he was a person. She thought that was a bell witch coming there while they were in there. And Bo stood back and laughed and laughed because he, he knew that he didn't want to tell him that it was just him. He didn't want to burst her bubble. One night I was staying with my grandmother. I was very young four at most and in my mind I woke up and just felt like I had to go downstairs in the middle of the night and when I went downstairs I saw a ghost behind the stove and even as a young child I didn't think it was a ghost it, it just didn't even make sense to me I thought well that's the boy across the street he snuck into the house and he's trying to scare me. So I started crying and ran up and got my grandmother and she came down and of course the ghost wasn't there anymore. And I remember having my head in her lap crying and her soothing me and telling me it was just a nightmare. 
And then the way I remember it, we went back upstairs and I laid in bed and I couldn't help but keep thinking about it. And I went down again and it was there again. Now, why did that happen? I think it was a nightmare, maybe sleepwalking, um, lucid dreaming. But my grandmother and I would talk about it over the years and I'd say, remember when I saw the ghost? And she said, Karen, it was just a nightmare. But in my mind and today, even today, it was so real. Um, and, and that's why people believe in these things. Visitors come to Adams, Tennessee from all over the world to learn about the Bell Witch. Even if they never spot an evil specter lurking in every corner of this quaint frontier town, they're bound to fall under the spell of its charm. When you come to Adams, there's a lot to see and do for a small town. Our motto is year-round country fun, and there are good places to eat. There's Adam Station Barbecue, which has excellent barbecue and home cooking, and the uh, Moss's Restaurant has great steaks and burgers. And It used to be the Schoolhouse Cafeteria, is what it was. It was also known as the Bell Witch Cafeteria at one time. Now, we've had a few little incidents happen out here, knocks and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, we got a little thing up there we stub our tickets on. It come flying across the room, and nobody was near it. But, you know, we just told her, you know, Kate, go away, we're busy, we don't have time to food with you, so, you know. And then Red River Canoe is, um, a little bit further down the road on Highway 41, and that provides camping experience and canoeing, and they have a lot of festivals throughout the year. But the Bell School Grounds has a lot of festivals year-round as well. We have the Thresherman Show in July, and uh, that's been going on for about 43 years now, every year. And they have gentlemen that um, have an old-fashioned wheat thresher and uh, a sawmill, um, a blacksmith shop, and other antique tractors that actually uh, perform the craft there. They also have tractor pulls and other activities, but um, it's neat to see the way these, these craftsmen operate, you know, uh, back then. We also have the Bell Witch um, Bluegrass Competition in September. Square dancing and bluegrass music and picking and grinning all over the grounds. And um, we end the year with the uh, spirit play in October during Halloween, which tells the story of the Bell family and the Bell Witch. It is a very much attended tourist attraction. And I sold tickets to people from Australia, Sweden, Germany, the Ukraine, and they came. And how they heard about it, I not, did not know. I knew it was a local phenomenon, maybe even a national, but an international. I had no idea. The legend is very popular. It's been around for 196 years, and people come from thousands of miles, even fly from overseas, to learn about the bells. In Robertson County in Adams, we have the Bell Witch Cave, and we have the old farmland of John Bell Sr., and we have a Bell Cemetery and an old Bell School. We're going to visit the Bell Willet City of Adams Museum. We're going to visit the Bell Cabin, which is owned by the museum itself, at least part of the original Bell House. The building behind me is the last standing structure from the original Bell Farm. It was a cabin that was some dated to be built around 1820, and this was the time of the haunting that was going on, and this cabin was moved here on the grounds of Bell School in the early 1980s, and this cabin basically was used by sharecroppers up until the 1970s. So uh, it has quite a history unto itself.
This is the place you would come to find out more about the Bell family and their spirit. On the wall, we have items that related to Adams, and especially back here in the corner, we have a picture of John Bell Jr. up high and some of the documents associated with his life. We have at least one document here uh, telling us what he had given his oldest daughter when she got married. $110 for a horse and saddle, $500 for a slave named Mary. The slaves, of course, uh, at the Civil War the, were freed, but uh, as they became adults, they were probably worth anywhere from $1,200 to $2,000. We have some stuff in the middle that related to his father and, of course, the drawing of his sister, Betsy. Uh, she seemed to be even nervous in her older age. One of her great-great-granddaughters stated that she would never sleep alone. Always had a grandchild or somebody with her, and she would always sleep against the wall and let the child or whoever was with her sleep on the outside of the bed. Adams, Tennessee takes its name from the local train station built in 1859. Ever since, the town has been a popular stop for anyone with a taste for adventure. Signs of its colonial past can still be found everywhere. The riches of the cotton plantations is what attracted families like John Bell's. But it's the infamous Bell Witch who continues to draw the crowds. Well, even before the movie came, became famous, it was the stories, the folklore stories. Any time a folklore booklet comes out or a new production comes out, whether it's a movie or a TV show, people will flock to Adams. They'll come to Robertson County to see if they can be a part of the Bell Witch experience. A lot of them are curious if she actually exists, and they will roam around the town and visit City Hall and find directions to some of the places that are prominent in the legend and they will try to experience it for themselves. I moved here in 1969, and basically I love the rural setting. That's where I basically came from. And that although the area has grown, we try to keep our rural setting. And, uh, you know, we will fight, basically, I will fight basically any attempts to modernize it any more than it is. Well, we have a, a great little town here, and and it's a lot like Mayberry. Uh, it's a small town feel, and the people that are in leadership in the past were had a lot of foresight in the way they planned things and tried to bring people here. And so now it's one of the biggest tourism draws in the county. You know, I think there are things that happened. And I think it's at one time, something happened a long time ago that caused the spirit to be written. It, it became a legend and it was told more and more and more. And as, as the legend grows, it gets bigger and better. You know, more people wants to know about it. And it's something that did happen, but uh, of course it was so long ago, we can't explain it. Weird things happen in Adams all the time, but especially during the play in Spirit Week, the last two weekends of October. Come on down, you never know what you might encounter. Whenever people experience the Bell Witch and they come here, they want to be a part of it. And so they'll either drive by the cave or they'll drive by the school or the cemetery, and they may have car problems afterwards. Now, whether those car problems are from neglect or from the Bell Witch is you know, to be seen, but a lot of them will like to attribute things happening to them and experiences happening to them because of the Bell Witch presence in Robertson County. In the heart of Pennsylvania, a strange creature has been seen over the countryside and forests. We may be dealing with maybe a possible flying creature. We don't know. Around here, they call it the Thunderbird. I wouldn't want to be in his food chain. We just keep going out there and we keep trying to you know, find those pieces of the puzzle that are missing. And they are somewhere, and they will be fine. Pennsylvania, USA, a state rich in history. The Philadelphia metropolitan area is considered the birthplace of American democracy. It's also famous for its beautiful natural surroundings and for once being the center of America's steel industry. Today, its rural areas seem frozen in time, small enclaves forgotten to history. But this state has a well-kept secret. Here, locals are passionate about all things paranormal. And it is said that sometimes, at dusk, strange creatures take to the skies. I'm Joe Mayer, 
and from South Greensburg, I'm a stonemason. It was just about dark. The sky still had light in it, but it was real close to turning dark, late dusk. And uh, it just came out of nowhere. I mean, it made no noise except the swish of the wings I heard. And I was, when I looked up, it was just like this. I mean, it just never looked at us or anything. It just was on a mission, I guess, heading somewhere to feed. We were out here. My wife, Ryan, and our neighbor were sitting right there. I was over to fire here, flipping the ribs. And I heard a flapping behind me. It sounded like a whoosh sound of a wing. And I turned around and looked, and up in the sky behind me was a huge bird. It was right there. It was right there. I watched this wing. I heard the wing coming down as I turned around, and it went straight down that road. Right where the ditch is in the tree up there, it probably cleared that tree right 20 feet. Its second wing flap was about where that telephone pole was. The next one was about halfway down that road, and then it was gone. It was that fast. It was like 10 seconds, maybe 12 seconds, and it was gone. What was that? I don't know. And I jumped in on the internet after that, and we were looking up birds, and we seen nothing that looked like it. Yeah, nothing. Closest thing to that was. In, in color-wise, was like like a golden eagle, which is a darker brown. But it was I've seen eagles. That wasn't an eagle. I was just a huge bird. Mary is passionate about anything paranormal. She knows all of the Thunderbird stories. I've talked to many people who have actually had encounters of various kinds. People who have seen it flying, people who have seen it, people who have complained that the fish in their pond have all disappeared because the Thunderbird has eaten them. Um, friends that have had little dogs taken from a fenced in yard at night. So yeah, I, I know some Thunderbird stuff. For Mary, monsters aren't just a passion, they're a job. This is my store. It's a gift shop. It's got all kinds of fun stuff in it. We like monsters. Well, right now we're studying Thunderbirds because the Thunderbird is well known around here for doing some very strange things. Okay, Thunderbirds, dream catchers, cards with Thunderbird feathers on them. Come on, Bigfoot. You can actually have your picture taken with Bigfoot. This is a picture of an Indian teepee with a thunderbird. You can see what they were seeing. And it wasn't a heron, and it wasn't an eagle, and it wasn't a, an owl. It was something else. I think it's a small segment of the population that really finds them interesting, wants to know more, wants to follow up on them, wants to look for themselves to see, you know, looking around to see if they can see something. So I'd, I'd say it's a small part of our population, but a serious one, are keeping track of what goes on. South Greensburg, a small town of 2,000 inhabitants, has experienced the most Thunderbird reports. In this small, tightly knit community, news of the paranormal spreads like wildfire. I'm Betty Dobies, mayor of South Greensburg. It's just a friendly town. Everybody is, they look out for each other. You know what I mean? It's like a, a knitted community where everybody looks out for each other. We don't bother each other, but if there's a problem, everybody comes in and helps solve that problem or help you out in any way they can. It's just that kind of communities that we have here. It would have a big wigs band that people have seen as far as, oh, Acme and all around the area. Somebody's seen it up on 819. A friend of mine's seen it up in Acme where they have a pond. But as far as being a Thunderbird or not, I can't answer that. But there are sightings of a big bird, and that's what it is. Mike is one of those who saw the disturbing, elusive creature. It was uh, September 2001, and I was uh, standing on the 
porch right of my old house watching the traffic go by it was on a major highway 119 in greensburg and um caught my uh, attention was a noise uh of, it sounded like uh, flags flapping in a thunderstorm and uh, i looked up and i thought i saw a plane i did a double take like a small plane and here it was a bird its wingspan was stretched out it might have been 50 feet up in the air but i could tell that the wings would stretch almost three lanes of a four-lane highway and uh, it inspired me to paint this this is beyond the edge radio nervous scared don't be afraid the wait will be over soon Sit down, strap in, and hold on tight. Please go live in five, taken. four, three... Hey, good evening and welcome to another edition of Beyond the Edge Radio. We are live here on the Para-X Radio Network and Planet Paranormal, 803 here on the East Coast, and it is Sunday. Eric Altman spends all his free time chasing monsters. He would love to add the Thunderbird to his trophy case. People describe the Thunderbird as a large bird, usually black in color from the beak to the, uh, the talons. Um, sometimes it's covered in feathers, sometimes not, but usually when it's covered in feathers, as I said, it's black. Um, sometimes they describe a white ring around its neck, other times no. Um, when it's not f covered with feathers, they usually describe it having like a membrane, or like a reptilian membrane or like a, a leathery type of skin to it. Um, and the wingspan it ranges in size from 8 foot and I've heard reports as much as 20 foot in length. A very large, large bird. We looked on the internet to find out what it could be and uh, we re kept running into Stan Gordon's name. So I called him up and put a report in and he came down and interviewed me over and asked me to draw a picture of it. In Pennsylvania, when the supernatural is spotted, Stan Gordon is called to the rescue. He has carefully documented all the evidence on the Thunderbird. My name is Stan Gordon. I'm from Greensburg, Pennsylvania. I've been researching, investigating strange and unusual happenings here in Pennsylvania since actually I started in 1959 when I was 10 years old. The main thing I do is gather information. Witnesses call me on sightings either by way of email or my hotline, which has been available to the public since 1969. And I interview people, try to figure out what they saw. Uh, cases that warranted, we try to go out and do first-hand investigations. Many of the phenomena I investigate, whether it be strange creatures or UFOs, many of these things, as we track them down, we can go to, the, we can find an explanation for them. Many of these things are misidentifications. We can figure out what the people see. But year after year, people continue to report these encounters with something that, as of yet, we don't have the answers for. Pennsylvania is fertile ground for Eric Altman and Stan Gordon. It is said that monster sightings are more common here than in any other state in the country. Historically, Pennsylvania has always been active with a history of strange phenomena, from accounts from the Native Americans to articles in newspapers of the 1800s to the present. People see things year after year throughout the state of Pennsylvania. I'm not sure why this area has such a history of strange phenomenon. I really don't know, but it, it just does. Reports back from the 50s onward, um, some of the more recent ones have taken place in the 90s through the 2000s. The most recent was in 2013, but um, they go back as, as far back as the 50s. Um, and we're aware of across the, the nation, there have been reports dating back to the 1800s. Many of the reports initially appear to be strange and unusual, but when you go out and do the investigation, the majority are found to be either natural or man-made in origin. It's very hard, for example, when you see an aircraft in the sky or a bird to get a, an idea of the actual altitude and size. We've had instances of these huge birds, these Thunderbird reports, where they are also at very, very close range, and there was a way that they were able to measure and get a pretty good idea of the wingspan of those very large flying creatures. Over the years, I've gathered a lot of information, interviewed hundreds and hundreds of witnesses, gathered various type of physical evidence, saw different patterns to various phenomena. So I'm convinced that there's phenomena out there that we don't have an explanation for. 
But where could this giant bird come from? According to witnesses, the creature could be millions of years old. Some of the reports describe something as very large, but with leathery skin, they look like a giant bat. And then other witnesses that come forward who have seen some of these huge flying creatures at pretty close range, and reluctantly they tell me that they look like something that was prehistoric. We may be dealing with maybe a, a pterodon or a pterosaur, uh, an, an extinct you know, possible flying creature. We don't know. And this is one of those mysteries with so many of these strange creature reports, whether we're dealing with Thunderbirds or Bigfoot, or we get Black Panther sightings in the area, other types of strange tree creatures. And it's not only in Pennsylvania, but the question always comes up, where do they come from and where do they go? Really uh, startling to see something that large. But I also heard that they're uh, harbingers of doom. Lou DeRose is a lawyer and amateur historian. For this citizen of South Greensburg, it's not surprising that monster stories have a strong resonance here. I'm originally from the area. I was born just north of Greensburg, and I've been here 45 years. Uh, I'm involved in the Westmoreland County Historical Society. I'm the past chair of that group. I've written uh, a book about the history of Greensburg. I've written some other chapters about local history and things like that. Well, we, we're good, uh, adventurous stock. You know, the Scotch-Irish were adventurous and hardworking and eager to take on new challenges. And I think their descendants and all of us just sort of adopted that philosophy. You know, oh, this is interesting. You know, what happened here? What, a Bigfoot sighting? Let's go find that guy. A uh, UFO sighting, let's go out and sit out in the woods for, you know, 40 years and see if there's another one. I'm, I think it's terrific. The belief in this mythical bird is nothing new for the First Nations of Pennsylvania. My name is Christian Allen. Uh, my native name is Kalista Ndokwa. I'm of mixed heritage, but I'm a descendant of the Sewickley Sept of the Shawnee. Uh, for my people, the Thunderbird is the gatekeeper of heaven. Um, it is something that watches over us. When it's here, it's flesh and blood. It's a solid, an animal, uh, but it has the capability to disappear. I think what they saw would be what it would look like. Um, for us, it would resemble a falcon in shape, it would be very, very large. Uh, it would be following the same paths, which you, both of the eyewitnesses, it was following the same path. So I, I think as far as their eyewitness report, it doesn't differ from what my people would believe that you would see. The sightings all seem to converge on the same place, the forest of Chestnut Ridge, a stone's throw from South Greensburg. One of the most interesting areas in the country is the Chestnut Ridge. The Chestnut Ridge is a 100-mile-long mountain range that runs from Preston County, West Virginia, to Westmore and Fayette, Indiana County in southwest Pennsylvania. It is one of the most active areas year after year for Thunderbird reports. And for whatever reason, that area over around Derry in Westmoreland County, along the base of the ridge, is very, very active. In this immediate area, uh, again, locally over the years, I've heard people talk about describing me this loud whoosh or swooshing sound. They gave an impression of something big and flying close by, but they didn't see what was causing the sound. What's interesting is it's all within a couple of miles, maybe not even that far. Yeah, I was standing right here on the porch, and the bird flew out from these woods over here, right over the hillside, and it lingered above the traffic, its wings out, and it flew up over into these trees here, and there used to be a big dead tree on that hillside, and that's where it landed. It, it happened. You know, you ain't gonna tell me I didn't see it. So I know what I saw, and I know what my buddy saw, and I know what my wife saw. And uh, that's just how it is. It's a big bird, and not from Sesame Street either. It has a great area for any kind of animal to live and um, you know, breed and, and 
have no problem staying hidden from, from man because it's, it's such a wild area. Um, a lot of forested covery, water area, a lot of uh, good food source. So uh, it's a great area for any kind of animal to really hide out and, and stay in and not really be bothered by. But that bird, I wouldn't want to corner that bird. I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to be in his food chain. Return to the scene, observe the skies, and study the creature's habitat. These are the standard methods of Eric Altman. What we try to do as researchers, if, if an eyewitness has a sighting at a specific location, we try to go to that location and we try to search the area to see if there might be physical evidence, feathers or, or maybe droppings or something that can show us that there was an animal in that area. I followed in, up on these reports over the years, um, and uh, I believe that the eyewitnesses are seeing something. I don't know what they're seeing. Uh, of course, I wasn't there to validate what they saw, but they're seeing something that they can't identify, and that's what I'm trying to find out. It's a challenge, but it's, it's what makes it interesting is, is you know, just having that, that thrill of the chase to get out there and, and try to find out. Eric Altman can count on followers to accompany him in his research. I met Eric at a, a conference, actually. Um, he was speaking about Bigfoot. Um, I sat to listen to it because I really wasn't aware at that time of all the different sightings right in my own backyard. Um, we quickly became good friends because he's open-minded and he likes adventures and I'm the same way. So, And now we co you know, I co-host on BTE Radio with him. Um, so, And we're at a lot of events together, just a great guy. You know, stories about the Thunderbirds um, for the, over the past decade, 2001 to I believe in May 2014, there's been sightings off and on. Everyone keeps describing the same type of creature, a bird with about a 20 foot wingspan, black and brown in color. It's always seems to be the same kind of a story. Someone's out alone walking or riding a motorcycle. There's no other witnesses but the one account. I am a skeptic. I've never personally had somebody tell me an account of seeing the Thunderbirds, but I've, I've read a lot of different stories, and I came down here to Greensburg to see for myself what the area is all about. I want to have the proof before I make a decision on what's being seen and told about. I believe some they're seeing something, but without me being there and just getting bits and pieces, I can't say for sure what it is. Before entering Chestnut Ridge, Altman motivates his troops and organizes the hunt for the Thunderbird. Basically what we're going to do is, is try to come up with an area where there have been a lot of sightings at and uh, check that area out, see if we can find anything. And it seems like the best area to go to would be what makes sense, South Greensburg, because that's where Joe's had his sighting at. And what Christian was explaining is where a lot of the burial mounds seem to be and, and there have been sightings in the last decade. So that might be our best bet. People think that this is all populated area. They think uh, that, you know, it's all are you good on, urban area, suburban area, and, and there's no way big animals could hide out. Oh, you go down this Sickville, it's all mines. Yeah. Sickville, there's mines everywhere down there, open mm -hmm. mines everywhere down there. But uh, for today's um, outing, we're taking some very basic, simple equipment with us. A no. pair of binoculars, so we can keep an eye on the, the trees and the, the sky in case we do see something. Um, a GPS, so we can map our, uh, our coordinates. If we want to return to that area, we'll know where, if we did find anything. And of course, the 16-foot tape measure, so if we do find anything, we can document what we do find as far as evidence. And if we do need to return to the area, we can return with uh, a DNA kit and uh, collect whatever physical evidence we can collect. Well, of course, we want to document it on video camera and, and uh, hopefully get some pictures of it. And Probably get a picture of me running and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get the gear packed up and we'll be ready to roll. I am scared, but it still drives me out in the forest to look for things. Sneaking along the ridges, looking for sign, basically. Look for feeding area, bones, anything like that. There's a couple of different ways to go in down here. If you cut straight down this road and swing to the left, that'd take you right to the wetlands. You can cut up the trail to the ridge and go out that way and down too. Okay. 
For Christian Allen, there is no doubt that they are on the very edge of the Thunderbirds' habitat. As far as what we look for today, we were basically hunting a flesh and blood creature. And this is a place where a lot of people don't even know it's here. And it has a lot of food and cover for such a creature to exist. But Eric Altman and his friends are not the only ones interested in the winged creature. My name is Brian Shema. I'm the conservation director for the Audubon Society of Western Pennsylvania. The organization was founded in 1916. Uh, the mission of the Audubon Society of Western Pennsylvania is to um, educate and connect people to the natural world. I oversee uh, much, of our, much of our operations, daily operations. I oversee all of our conservation work, and I am the resident bird expert. Pennsylvania is, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of diverse habitats in Pennsylvania. Uh, we actually have um, a, a lot of flowing water, actually uh, more miles of stream than any other state um, in the lower 48 states. Um, a lot of individual um, interesting habitats exist within Pennsylvania. Largest bird in Pennsylvania is bald eagle. Uh, their wing spread is right, right around between six and six and a half feet. Um, you know, they have the iconic white head and white tail um, when they're mature. When they're immature, the bird's all brown. So bald eagles are actually confused with a lot of other species, um, but uh, it is the largest bird that we have in Pennsylvania. We're actually also a mixing zone for uh, when speaking specifically of birds. We have a number of northerly breeding birds that exist in Pennsylvania, as well as a number of southerly breeding birds in Pennsylvania. So we're kind of a mixing zone for uh, two, different, you know, two different groups of birds that, that prefer different latitudes. We try to um, piece together the puzzle, so to speak. We want to see if there's more information out there than just that eyewitness a story. And we want to try to find out what they saw too. If something like that's still around, it'd be the fine of a century. No person has been injured or killed by a Thunderbird in Pennsylvania. And despite its intimidating size, we shouldn't fear it. So says Christian Allen, at least. Like I say, it's, an omen, it's a good omen. It means you're being taken care of. It's not something to be frightened of. Um, they also come with storms. If there's a storm coming, like a really bad storm, you'll see them. They're warning you. Batten hatches, it's coming. Um, they come out of water, which is another good thing because they can always come out of clean water, and we all need that. So it could be something to lead you to water. As you can see, it's clean. Uh, this water's. All you need is a few drops of bleach and to boil it and you can drink it. Yeah, you can see there's some fish there. Yeah. Creek chubs. Actually, it would help to, if we were being noisy, to flush something out. Maybe startle something that it would take off. You never know. Just looking. I think in one of the higher up trees, like the tree out there, it would find a larger, flatter tree and put a nest up in that area there, but it's anybody's guess. We don't even know if they nest in trees. But according to Brian Shima, the searches conducted by Eric Altman are likely to be unsuccessful. If that bird existed in a populated area, I think everyone would agree that someone like me would know about it overnight. Um, the, the sightings would come to our organization. We are the bird experts in Western Pennsylvania. We are the bird conservation organization for Western Pennsylvania. And uh, where we saw it, it was kind of in line, flying in line with the trail, but about 100 yards to the left, right down the road. And that was pretty neat. But I mean, the fact that you saw one right up the road and there was another one seen right up the road there, that's kind of too much of a coincidence in the same area for not to be something to it. People that, that, that see uh, what they think might be a, might be a Thunderbird um, could very well be the perspective that they're, that they're viewing from. 
Uh, it could be a very large bird. You know, it could be a, it could be a, a, a red-tailed hawk. It could be a bald eagle. It could be a golden eagle. Um, each of these being large birds. But when um, looking at, at it from a certain perspective, they might not have a way of judging how large that bird actually is. Well, I mean, any any kind of raptor is diet's protein. And yeah. That's here. You yeah. See anything? No. Oh. That's all. That's all. Such heavy swamp in there. I mean, you can't get yeah. through there. I tell you, I feel a little e uneasy back here. I just, I don't know. It's pretty. I love nature, but there's just, I don't know. Spooky. Something. Yeah. Something here. I feel spooky. Let's see what we got here. It's a myth. Uh, you know, it's, it's scientifically speaking, there have been no records, um, any, no documentation whatsoever um, of a bird such as that. There's a, there is really a lot of evidence that shows that it would be basically impossible uh, for a bird like that to exist. If the Thunderbird were to exist, there would need to be a large enough population to, to sustain genetic diversity, which means many of us would be seeing Thunderbirds on a daily basis. Without that genetic diversity, that species would quickly, um, the, the, the diversity would deteriorate and the species would simply not exist. Kristen Allen doesn't have any elaborate theories. For him, the Thunderbird is an ancestral belief. This is a recreation of, I hate to say this, but it's similar to like a rosary so that you can remember your prayers. And these are things that you're thankful for, like this means family. And these symbols here that look like keyholes are thunderbirds, the thunderers that are the guardians of heaven. It's very important to our culture and it's something that we today keep alive, but we believe it exists. Whether it's flesh and blood or from the other realm, as these sticks would suggest, we believe it's possible that you can see it and you're gonna to continue to see it. And like I said, it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Do we know where he is? That's he, he went in there. Oh, man. Heavy back here. Doe, fawn. Oh, are you okay? Now, fun. see, that's why I quit following you, right there. <laughs> <Are> you? <laughs> I look for hair, I look for feathers, everything back, I didn't see anything like that. You know, so I figured if there was gonna be anything, it'd be around the, the green bar, the jag bushes. You know, I'd grab hair, or grab feather, or whatever. I didn't see anything like that. There's really no area that they could build a nest off the ground back there either. There's some buffalo grass growing back there in some of the openings. It was all laid flat, laid flat in a swirl like this. And I showed her one right up here. But as I got in further, I found three different spots like that in there. Where either it, it's, you would think a herd of deer, four or five deer maybe bedding together, but usually you'll see the individual pockets where the deer are laying, you know, in the grass, but I didn't see that. I just saw a whole area. So that's strange. The ultimate goal of cryptozoologists is to confound science, to discover the unexplainable. And every little clue that brings them closer to that goal is worth evaluating. This is an owl. Oh, looks like an owl. I find feathers every time I walk, and sometimes like they'll be laying on my car seat, like that shouldn't be, but it, wow. Some tribes see the owl as an omen that somewhere in your family's getting to pass. My tribe's a little different. To us, it was a war bird. Okay. And by this, they actually kept owls as pets. Naturally, if you're going to go to war against someone who's definitely afraid of owls, you're going to have an owl with you. OK. <laughs> so a mile and a half long, I'd say. Yeah. Comes all the way out to four quarters. Large. Large. This little swamp here. Today, we got unlucky. Inconclusive. Um, we got to look at some great terrain, great area, a great water source and food source, and sure it could 
probably hide a large bird of that size without anybody being around to see it. Um, are we going to find it from just a walk out in the woods? No. It probably is going to take a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of manpower, and it's just the right place at the right time. And we might get lucky, but it's just the luck of the draw, getting out there and doing it. You can hunt turkeys because they're usually on the ground, but to hunt a large falcon-shaped bird, you have to follow that animal, know its habits. It would take forever, I think, just to come out and see one. I'm not going to bet that you are. So what did Joe and the dozens of other witnesses see? Did they just make the whole thing up? I think that there are rational explanations to what people are seeing. Um, and I think that, you know, through some education and through some awareness, um, we might be able to get to the bottom of what it is these people are seeing and how they're confusing uh, the, the size of these birds. Um, or something that we see on a daily basis, like large hawks or large eagles. I think that pe the humans are curious. And I think that, you know, with technology, uh, certainly the internet, if, if someone were to Google uh, extremely large bird, there is a lot of information out there about various myths or, or real facts. I think that the human curiosity is oftentimes something that, that may lead people um, down the road of myths. For his part, Stan Gordon believes that the abundance of evidence confirms that this is not just a myth. The Thunderbird really does haunt the skies of Pennsylvania. I mean, I've been taking calls from the public on these sightings since 1969. So a lot of people know that there's a place they can report sightings to. I had founded and directed three volunteer research groups that started in 1970 and continued to 1993 that were very, very active throughout the state of Pennsylvania. We had a lot of scientists and engineers and research people, uh, former military intelligence people, law enforcement officers who were part of our volunteer group. So we had trained people who were going out there to look into these mysteries. And it was our goal to try to investigate these cases, to try to find an explanation, which in many cases we did. But year after year, these incidents continue to occur and not every case can be so easily dismissed. Although sightings of the Thunderbird are concentrated in the South Greensburg area, there are still many skeptics here. I mean, I've seen some large birds in, in the area, but nothing super large to where it's a supernatural bird. Yeah, it's almost as bad as the Mothman. That's ridiculous to me, the Mothman, really. And the absence of any hard evidence doesn't help Eric Altman's cause. No photographs, no video, there's no evidence. And, and that's what, I can see the skeptic's argument, you know, where's the proof? Where's the, where's the, where's the photographs? Where's the video? Where's, where's the, the, we don't have any. And, and I, have to, I have to agree with the skeptics. So why aren't people whipping out their cell phone cameras? Everybody has one. You know, everybody has you know, the access to a camera or on the cell phone or video. Why aren't people taking pictures? But, I mean, we all had cameras. My camera was sitting right here, our phone cameras. They, both, they all had their phone in their hands right there. And, and there it was, and we didn't take a picture. Stupidity. We were kind of like just watching it, yeah? Didn't think of it. People seeing something, yeah, I believe maybe they're seeing a bird of some sort. It definitely is not a thunderbird. There's no such thing. It just, just doesn't sound right, just doesn't make sense. I'd have to see it. You'd have to catch one or kill one or something for me to believe it. You have to have physical evidence to prove the animal exists. Eyewitness testimony just doesn't cut it. So Doug's right, you have I, to have physical evidence. I've told Eric over the year, we've argued, I said, if I'm out in the woods and I'm hunting, I see Bigfoot or I see something that resembles it, I'm gonna shoot it. It's either I wanna be a hero or people are gonna hate me, so. And they'll probably hate him. And with the Thunderbird, um, he's right. Uh, people are seeing something, what it is, who knows. But what they're describing doesn't fit any of the known animals or any known birds that are around this area. It's much too large. I do believe in UFOs. Yes, I believe that there's creatures from other planets, because I think it would be absurd to believe that we're the only life in the universe. And you know, with the way it is today, they're discovering planet after planet. So there has to be life somewhere else. 
like Area 51, do I think? Or okay, well, let me ask you this question then. If you believe in Area 51 has UFOs and aliens there, but you've never seen them, why don't you believe in Bigfoot or Thunderbird? You've never seen those. Well, because I, for one, Bigfoot, you're always out there. People have cameras. The thing cannot be that elusive. You don't typically see a Bigfoot walking down the street or a Thunderbird flying through the air. It's not something that happens every day, so it, it's not accepted by science. It's not accepted by the general public, so you must be crazy. So people don't want to talk about stuff like that. So they're very reluctant to report or share their, their experiences. So many of these people were people who didn't believe that such creatures could exist until they had their own experience. And so many of these people have a difficult time dealing with it. Sometimes they don't want to talk about it. They're afraid to share the experience, afraid of being ridiculed. But some of them, it's a life-changing experience. And I run into this quite often. Only a few people today believe in the existence of the Thunderbird. But all the same, this mythical bird has found its way into American popular culture. From fighter jets to car brands, the Thunderbird has left its mark. It is a Thunderbird. <laughs> I got it because it's a protector and it's gonna keep my soul safe. That was why I liked this tattoo. Ananemki, which means thunderer. And of course, it says the folklore goes, the thunder and lightning that you hear, the rolling, the Papa Panawata, the rolling thunder you hear through the hills is caused by this bird flapping its wings. They believe that some of the valleys in the primordial days were shaped by this bird flying too close to the land and its wings swooped up the valleys. But today it's seen as a positive thing. It's a very important representation of the spiritual world to us and that we don't need to be predominated with the negative or the fear of it, that it's, it's something that should enliven you, edify you, let you know that life is good and good is in control and that you can relax and live your life. And that is, that is what the Thunderbird means to us. Well, I'm sure they've seen a bird and it is a big bird when it flies. It does have a big wingspan, but I don't know what to believe. I've asked people around and that's what they all tell me it is. There seems to be a really good way of telling the huge wingspan of these creatures, something that you can eliminate some of the big birds around here, some of the hawks and blue herons and other birds. And, and a lot of the witnesses I've talked to, by the way, are people who have hunted, people who are familiar with the native birds of Pennsylvania, and they realize that what they saw was something completely different than what they had observed. They saw the shape the figure of what we saw and what's in our tradition, so it's the same. For most of the residents in South Greensburg, the Thunderbird is an amusing legend. If the Thunderbird is flying around here, he better watch out because we have a big Boeing uh, 700 plane coming into Latrobe four or five times a day and it might get in the way. I believe in a lot of things I haven't seen though, you know, uh, on various levels. Uh, so who am I to say? I do believe in Bigfoot and all those other things out there. I believe in UFOs and things like that. I believe those things are happening. But as far as the bird, I've never seen it other than the blue heron, so I can't really. And I've never seen either one of the others, but for some reason I believe in them. People should keep an open mind. I mean, we are not going to move forward in time if we don't keep experiencing new things. I think you have to keep looking, you have to keep listening and you have to keep paying attention until we find out. And we have over time, science has proven a lot of things that people thought were bogus, you know? Science proved them wrong. So science eventually will catch up with everything. Hoping I live long enough to see some of it. There's a whole lot that science can't account for or explain. And there's so much around us that we don't see, that we use every day, radio waves, television waves. And we don't see that, but we know that they're here. So what makes other entities, maybe if they're from another dimension, why would that be difficult to understand? I think everybody wants their story to be heard. Um, and I would be in awe. Who am I to say that they didn't see what they saw? I, I wasn't there, so I would let them tell their story to me. I'm a safe place to tell a story to. These things apparently go on all the time, 
but a lot of people don't know where to call or are reluctant to report things, and some people wait for weeks or months or years later, or they never report in. So there may be a lot more that's going on on there than we have any idea of. For his part, Eric Altman isn't discouraged by the lack of tangible evidence. You would think if there was such a thing out there that people, a lot more people would see it. We'd have physical evidence of it. We'd have video. Science would know about it. Uh, we, would, we would know for sure they're out there, like the Bigfoot. They're eight foot, 10 foot, 12 foot tall. They're supposed to be a giant primate that runs around in the forest. People, thousands of people claim they see it. Why don't we have proof of it? The Loch Ness Monster is supposed to be a, this huge aquatic creature that lives in Loch Ness. And hundreds of people claim they've seen it, but we have no physical proof of it, except for maybe some grainy video footage. But people still claim they see it. Now, how are these large cryptids surviving and still being seen without any proof? We, we don't know. And that's what makes our job even harder and challenging. We just keep going out there and we keep trying to you know, find those pieces of the puzzle that are missing. And maybe one day we'll have the proof. It's just, it baffles the mind to think how such large creatures like the Thunderbird can fly around in our skies and only be witnessed from time to time and not leave any physical trace evidence. There has to be some kind of population of them. And they are somewhere, and they will be found. Because they wouldn't be cruising through here unless they were within the area. It could be here. I believe it definitely could be here. Joe Meyer continues to look to the sky in the hopes of catching a glimpse of this giant mythical bird. Since I've been hunting, since I saw that bird, I spend a lot of time looking up here and there too, especially when we're hunting up the mountains. Actually, anywhere, I look up quite a bit. Just, it's in my head now, you know, and I got a gun. <laughs> I'm sure I would probably freeze in fright. <laughs> I would hope that I have my camera. I have my camera for everything else to take pictures of, but I don't know, I'd be thankful too. I'd be thankful that I finally get the proof that I'm looking for. Yeah, I would like to see one. It, I think it would be a good experience, yeah. I'd love to see it again, like I said, but what are the chances, you know?